I would like to start this morning by showing you a couple of pictures. And before we get to those pictures, uh, I want you to look at the pictures, not me, but the pictures, and hear the words that I'm saying. And as I ask you certain questions, I want you, you to go with your immediate instinct. Really just, what's the first thing that comes to your mind as you look at the pictures? Okay. And so as we go to those pictures, as they'll turn it to the back, the first thing I want you to think about is, where are these people from? And not just think about their country, but think about their home, what their home is like, what's the makeup in their home, what is it really like where they're from. And as you think about where they're from, think about what they enjoy doing. What do they love to do? What is the first thing they go out and do? And as you consider that, what they enjoy doing, think about what they do for a living or what their hopes are for the future, what they want to do. And not even from a job perspective, but think about who will they be married to? What will they enjoy doing as a couple? And as you think about the future, now I want you to think about the past with these people. Think about what do you think the worst thing they have done in their lives is? What is the worst thing they have done? And as you think about the worst thing that they have done and everything else, Ask yourself this question. Are these people that you would want to be friends with? Are these people that you'd want to be your colleagues? Are these people the people that you would sit next to in church? Now, the reason I've shown you those pictures and the purpose of them is to not shame you this morning or to trick you, but to present this idea that we all have bias. And part of that bias is based upon how people look and their culture. And the reason I can say that confidently is because for our whole lives, the whole world, including our friends and our families and even ourselves, we have been taught the idea that what is same, what looks the same, what is familiar is comfortable, is something I can connect with. And what is different is unfamiliar, is awkward, is hard to connect with. And just to illustrate that idea a little bit further, how the world has done that, think about right now how you think about Jesus, the depictions of Jesus. What is the person you picture in your mind right now? Who you picture is someone that looks like you. And that's partly because of what Hollywood has done, but also the way we work. When I think of my creator, when I think of my savior, I want something that is comfortable to connect to, so I think of someone that looks like me, is my culture, my background. That's what we connect to. And the problem with that is that is not how God has created us. God has not created us to be people who only like one thing, who only spend time with one thing that is similar to us. God has created us for so much more. And in fact, because of how God cre has created us, in that we can find a different aspect of worship. Yes, I want you to think about that. What is on offer this morning is an aspect of worship that I think many of us are missing out on. And just as you think about that, think about that idea for a moment. Imagine if you came to church and they didn't sing songs. In fact, imagine you'd never, you'd never heard worship singing before. Imagine that idea, and then imagine the first time you would get to experience it. Yes, in the beginning, it would be a bit awkward. Everyone's singing. It's a bit weird. But then what would build up inside of you is joy as you connect with others as they sing about God together. 
Today in this sermon, where we are going, is the idea of unlocking a new aspect of worship for us. That yes, in some ways may be awkward in the beginning, but as we go into it, will feed us and draw us closer to God. And in order to do that, we need to go through a couple of points. You know, it wouldn't be a sermon if we didn't go through points, isn't it? But as we go into the first point, which will be dealing with our design, I want you to understand how it's going to work. I want to give us a foundation from the Bible and from theology of who we are and how we've been created. Now, for some of you, this may not be new, but I want you to have that foundation this morning because where we're going in our second point when we speak about breaking our bias is going to be really uncomfortable, really difficult for many of us myself included. Because what we're going to have to do as we break our bias is we're going to have to be really honest with each other and authentic. Not about just the past, but even now. But if you go with me through that second point, what we have in the third point, as we speak about celebrating, as we speak about worshiping our God, we will unlock something beautiful for each one of us that we can leave here growing closer to God and closer to each other. And so as we go through those points, let us go to our first point this morning, which is diverse design. And I'd like you to open up your texts into Genesis chapter one, as we look at three verses this morning. So if you'll turn to Genesis chapter one and verse 26, as we look at this idea of a creative creation, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, which says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I'm going to stop there this morning at that passage. So first, as we look at diverse design, let us look at the context of this passage. We need to remember who is writing this. Now, Adam didn't write this. The person that wrote this was Moses. And if you know your Bibles, Moses lived quite a long time after Adam. The earth had been filled a little bit. People had been multiplying. Oh, yes, they had. But... What's important for us to understand when Moses is writing this, when he's writing about the image of God, when he says man is created in God's image, do you think he's only talking about one type of person or how one person looks? No, it cannot be. Because as Moses is writing this, he is thinking about the many people that are around him. He's thinking about his wife, who is a different race to him. He is looking at the Israelites and how the Israelites are made up. And in fact, there are even Egyptians amongst him. And so for Moses, as he's writing this, he is going, I see the images of God in front of me. I'm not just thinking of one type of person. Now, for some of you, you may be saying, oh, that's a no-brainer, of course. He's not just talking about one race or one culture. But it's important for me to start here because there is teaching in this world that says one race or one culture is a superior form of image over everyone else, is a better image. And I think we can all agree that is not only wrong, that is evil. That is not what God is talking about. That is not what the Bible is talking about. So what is the Bible speaking about when we speak about image of God? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? 
Well, first, as we understand it, obviously, it means we're different to animals. Now, I know some of the wives are sitting here and go, you haven't seen how my husband walks around the house and how he smells. He's like a pig. He's quite close to pig. We're not talking about that. But rather, we're saying there's something fundamentally different to us, to animals. Yes, animals are loved by God, but when God created us, he created us in his image. We may have fingers like some animals in this world, and some animals may even communicate with others similar to us. But what makes us different to animals is that they weren't created in the image of God, and we were. There's something unique about each one of us. We are in his image. So what does it mean to be in the image of God? Well, first, as we think about it, as Bible commentators and theologians look at it, they're not talking about the idea that we physically look like God. God is spirit. But what they are saying is that there's something supernatural about us, something very different. And that works out in two ways. The first way is that we can have relationship with God. And that's more than just communicating with him. But we need to think about Adam. Adam walked in the garden with God. Adam saw God. Adam had a relationship with God. He connected with God. Yes, Adam connected with animals, but far more so than with God. And as he connected with God, they connected about his heart and he walked with them. And yes, sin then enters into the picture. But although there's been a breaking down, there's still relationship. In fact, God desires for us to have relationship. And as we have been going through the book of Hebrews, we have seen that Jesus in what he did draws us closer to God to have relationship with him. Jesus did not do that for the animals. He did it for us so that we can have relationship. But not only that, yes, the image of God gives us relationship with him, but also relationship with one another. Now, yes, part of that is communication, but our communication is so much deeper than the animals. The animals, they communicate about a couple of things, but mainly about food, we would agree. Now, I know for some of you go, well, that's a lot of my communication with the people. But where our communication is so much greater is we can talk about each other's hearts, our pasts. We can connect with people on a far deeper level. The image of God has made us unique in how we communicate with one another. And so as we think about how God has created us, it should make us amazed at who he is. Look how incredible our God is and how he has made us. And not only that, but he is also a creative creator. Before we get into that idea, I want you to look first at how God created us. God took his time with us. Everything else in creation is, God said, let there be light, light. God said, let there be water, water. God said, animals, animals. But then us, look at what happens. The Godhead has a discussion first. They talk with one another. Let us make man in our image. And then as we look in Genesis 2, we see how that goes even a step further. What then God does is that he then molds us out of the dust and clay of the ground. Not just by word, but molds us. And he does that not only for man, but for woman as well. As he takes woman out of man's rib, he molds her. And then he puts it a step further. He doesn't just leave it there, but he breathes life into us. He speaks into us. We become his image. It's amazing how God has created us and he tells us it is very good. And here's the beauty of what God does is that in us, he creates us with the potential to be diverse 
And the reason he does that is because sameness is boring. Think about this for a moment. I've had the privilege of going to Italy and seeing the Sistine Chapel. It is a marvelous piece of art. It's amazing what Michelangelo did. It's one of those things where you see how God can work through someone's giftings. It is a phenomenal piece of art. You walk in there and you get goosebumps at what you're seeing. But imagine for a moment that every single piece of art you ever saw in this world was the Sistine Chapel. As you went to museums, Sistine Chapel. In your house, Sistine Chapel. What would eventually happen? As you saw that, you'd just be bored. You wouldn't be like, wow, this is amazing. You'd just be like, yeah, same thing, over and over again. No, our God is creative. And so makes us different. So as he creates Adam, in Adam, he creates him with the potential to be diverse so that Adam's offspring have different personality, different races, different colors. In fact, as it speaks about Adam, it's quite possible as they use the name that he was red. I don't see a lot of red people around here unless you've been in the sun too long. But in him, there is diversity. And part of the reason that is, is because even in the Godhead, there is diversity. We believe in one God, one God who exists eternally as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And as such, they are all made of one substance, or it's not made, they are one substance. So therefore, they are divine, they are equal in every way, but they are still diverse because God the Father is not God the Son. And God the Son is not God the Holy Spirit. So even in perfect unity, in one Godhead, there is diversity. So how can we expect a God who is diverse not to create diversity? He must. He has to. He is creative. And so because he has created us in this way, because we are marvelous in the image of God, what does that then require us to do? It requires us to do three things. First, we need to acknowledge that the image of God is universal. Every single person that lives and breathes is the image of God. And it's important for us to understand that even after sin, you are still the image of God. And the reason I can say that is because in Genesis 9, when God is speaking to Noah, he says to them, if you kill someone, you kill the image of God. And so even after sin, we are still images of God. And so we must acknowledge that, that everyone here is an image. Secondly, in order to be true images of God, we need to go after the perfect example of humanity, which is Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, we have this understanding that to sin is to be human. And so we think the more you sin, the more human you become. And the more you don't sin, the more God-like you become. Nope, that is incorrect. In fact, the more you draw closer to Christ and God, the more human you really become because that's how God created you. That's what it means to be an image of God. And even as we think about Christ, think about how Christ connected with those around him, those who are from different cultures and races. Did he push them away? No, he loved them, drew them in. In fact, when you look at how he responds, he responds worse to the Jews than he does to the Gentiles. Those who are different, he draws in. As we acknowledge and as we go after being like Christ, the other thing that we must do, we must respect images of God. The reason you need to respect the person sitting next to you is because they are valuable, very valuable, because God created them. As you drive down the road and someone comes to your car, they are valuable because they are the image of God. They deserve respect. As you look at the news and you see terrible things, those are still images of God. And yes, God will bring justice, 
but they still are valuable. They are different to animals. This is what it requires us to do. But the problem with doing these three things is we have a step before this that we need to do. We need to break our bias. Now, before we go into this, I need to show you a picture of my family here, which is going to pop up. Now, you're going to notice something a little bit different about my family to some of yours. We're all good looking. <laughs> no, that's not what I meant. No, you can obviously see a little bit of the difference. But the reason I want to show you that is because where I'm going next. As we think about breaking our bias, I'm going to take you through a journey of my life as I've had to deal with errors. And it's to my shame that I've had to deal with them because I know one day I'm going to have to sit with my boy and have this conversation with him. And it hurts me deep down from what I've done in my past to the little boy that's in front of me. And so will you journey with me now as we look at a bit of my past, as we think about breaking our bias? And the journey doesn't start in a good place. It starts at high school. Not that high school is a bad place, <laughs> but it starts in high school. My friends and I, we are all taking Zulu. And so what happens when you learn Zulu and when you learn a new language, what do you do first? You learn all the bad words. That's what you do. Learn all the bad words. But what we used to do once we had learned those words is that we would go to people at our school, construction workers. We would go to people who cleaned, people who are obviously of different race to us, people who had no power over us because of their positions in life. And we would say the most horrendous and terrible things to them. Things that I wouldn't want even to, to repeat here right now. We go to these people and speak evil to them. And the worst thing about it for me was, I don't know if it was something I even believed, but the reason I did it was because all my friends were doing it and we thought it was fun. And I look back and I think about the faces of men and women as they looked at us, stupid kids. So we came to them and said this evil to their face and the rage that would come into their eyes because not only was I just attacking them, I was attacking their very nature and being and the pain they would feel and we would walk away laughing to my shame. This is part of my history. And I'm sure all of us can see that that is wrong. And it's from the pit of hell. I'm thankful that God came into my life near the end of high school. That Jesus saved me. And as Jesus saved me, I immediately knew I can't do these things anymore. This is wrong. And so I stopped saying those things. But where my problem was, I thought that was the end of it. I thought I'd fixed the problem, no more issues. But the problem is, is that for 18 years of my life, the world, my friends, and myself had been feeding into the darkness of my heart. And yes, salvation can do amazing things. It can bring much redemption, but it is a process. And I thought the process was done, but it had not even started in that area. And only later in my life, when my son came into my life, did I really start to become aware. I started to become aware of things like when I was in traffic in the car. Now I'd be driving in the car, good Christian person, driving in the car, and someone would cut me off. And my immediate thought, before 
I even knew who the person was in the car, I would think, black person. And when someone was coming up behind me and they were driving a bucky, driving right up my butt, my first thought, Afrikaans person. I had attached ideas without even really thinking about groups of people. And what was terrible about this is how it fed into my heart. And even more than that, it wasn't when I was wrong that was the problem. So as someone cut me off and it was actually a white person and I didn't really acknowledge it, what was really bad was when I was right. When the person cutting me off was black because that would just feed into the soul. Oh, I'm right about these things. Feed that darkness. And so that once when I'm sitting outside Dallas Theological Seminary, this religious institution, I'm sitting on a bench, and without even thinking, as I saw a black person walking down the road towards me, what did I do? I took all my, all my possessions and held them tightly without even thinking. And as the person passed me, he said to me, I, I don't steal, don't worry. I had made a decision without even consciously doing it because it was coming from my heart. Evil that I had not dealt with. And only when God brought my little boy into my life and I looked at this precious image of God in front of me that I start to become aware and go, how can I think of these things? How can I think of these things for my son? Just because he's a different color. It started me to make me aware of things in this world. Aware of things like small things, such as the idea of that, hey, I used to just go watch superhero films and they were great. But now I start to look like, oh, there's, there's a black superhero. Because when my boy sits next to me, he goes, dad, he looks like me. I was not aware of these things before because my heart was dark. I needed to become aware. And as I became aware, I needed to make two steps. The first step that I needed to make was I had to acknowledge that there is a sin problem in me, that I have an issue that I have an issue with race. And so I had to say privately to God and publicly to others, I had to say, I am a racist. And that is hard to say. One, because of the guilt we put upon that. One, because we've made it the unforgivable sin in this world, in churches. But also because everyone around me was saying, no, you, you're not. You have black friends. You can't be. And so I never, never even attempted to think about it until I had to acknowledge it and go, I struggle with this. I've done evil and wrong, and I need God to work in my heart. And as I had made that acknowledgement, I then needed to take it a step further because it can't just be that it can't just be a get out of jail card. It can't be just like, I am a racist. And they go, okay, whew, done. No, that's treating God's grace as cheap. It requires me to do something. And so what it required me to do was it required me to go to others, mature believers, mature believers who were of other races, and go to them and speak to them. And to their credit, these people did not take vengeance upon me. Vengeance that probably they deserved. But rather, they treated me with grace and said, David, we'll come alongside you and help you. And what that required of me was to listen, and to be teachable, and to know the next steps I needed to take. I know that this journey is hard. 
It requires us to look into our hearts, which is not a great place sometimes. But I also know that our God is gracious and loves redemption and wants us to draw closer to him. And as we draw closer to him, we can connect with each other better. As we break our bias, it then gives us the opportunity to do all those other things that I spoke about in the image. And even more than that, it then brings us to our third point, which is amazing. It brings us to this, that we can celebrate creativity. What do I mean by that? As we celebrate diversity, we worship the creativity of God. And that is the worship that I'm talking about. As we celebrate diversity, we worship the creativity of God. Think about it. We do it in every other aspect of our lives. Think about the songs that we sing. Think about how the Bible talks about it in the Psalms. It speaks about worshiping not only the mountains, but the valleys. Not only the earth, but the stars. And so then, as we come together and look at other images of God and we sing together, we unlock something. Look at our diverse nature, God, as we celebrate you. And even more than that, think about how we do it in GC groups. Isn't it amazing when you sit with others from different perspectives, different heritages, different backgrounds, and you sit there and you have a discussion with them how worship grows in your midst. And even more than that, isn't it amazing when someone who comes from a completely different background to you, completely different world almost in fact, and you sit and you say the same thing about God. That is worship. It is amazing to me as I've sat with people in poverty who have spoken about how God provides, how it's made us worship. As you sit with people who are from worn, torn countries who speak about the love of God, how that feeds your soul. And as you speak to others who have been affected by crime in their communities who still speak about the justice of God. That is a worship that I think many of us are missing out on. And what I love about this is as, as we do that, as we connect with one another, people from diverse groups, as we speak with one another, God looks at that and is pleased and goes, look at my creative creation, how they communicate with each other and me. This is the images of God I have made. That is something to go after. And it's not just us trying to look like each other. That's not the concept. I could have come this morning and dressed in African garb. And to be honest, that would be horror for you. Why? Because my skin is white. Yeah, amen, indeed. Okay. And it would shine off. And I would look ridiculous. That's not my heritage. And that's not how we be diverse. It's not by trying to look like another culture or race. But it's rather in us connecting with them. As I connect with Buddy and speak with Buddy and have conversations with him, my understanding of his heritage and culture grow even further. So even if Buddy was to cut me off in the road, which he may do, I no longer attach that to him, but rather attach the idea of who he is and his race. And it feeds my heart. As I communicate with Shaw, who does drive a Bucky in fact, <laughs> and I celebrate his culture and heritage, it gives me a better perspective of him. So I'm not always attaching negative, but rather feeding in to my soul how God has made us. And so this morning, as we think about these ideas, as we apply this into our life, as we break our bias by for some of us maybe coming to admit the issue and then seeking out help. And as we go out and really celebrate images of God, 
what I would like to ask us today, to practically do today, if you're able to, and really try to do it, come to our picnic today. Come to the Heritage Picnic today. Spend time with us today. And spend time in diversity. Now, some of you may not be able to do that, but I re- online, if you're out there, come, come spend time with us. At least start to apply it into your life. And as you go there this morning, let me first speak to the white people. As you go there and you take your seat, don't hunt the one black person. Where, oh, we're coming around. You come with us. Look how diverse we are. And black people on the side, I hope you're not like cautiously going, where the white people at? Someone's coming to get me. That's, That's not the idea at all. But rather, be aware as you sit there with others, as white people in this church, as you sit there with others, go, hey, why not invite a few of people from different races and cultures into our group? Let's communicate. And for those who aren't white, look out and go, hey, I'm going to approach this group with my friends and I'm going to come sit with them. And will it be awkward? Yes, of course it's going to be awkward. It will be. It's always awkward as we talk to new people, but as we communicate with one another and we let it sink into our souls and we let it come up a little bit more, we start to really find out what it means to be a diverse group and how we worship God. And in that, I can promise you, there is wonderful joy, wonderful hope. As we sit with people, even people we may have hurt in our lives, and we celebrate the creativity of God, we start to connect to something that is truly heavenly. Let us go after that. Let us be true images of God. Let me close and pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for each individual that is here this morning and the mighty work that you have done in our lives. And Father, I pray first and foremost that you would forgive us. Forgive us where we have gone to just what is similar, that we have let possibly hate into our hearts, that we have not really dealt with our pasts. I pray for each one of us who is struggling in that way, Father, help us to go out in grace, whether that grace is admitting these an issue or whether that grace is connecting with others and helping them through it. Help us really live out your gospel. And Father, as we do that, I pray that we would truly celebrate our diversity in this wonderful country, in this wonderful church, Father. Help us celebrate it because we know as we do so, we worship our amazing creative God and God, you are creative. Thank you. In your son's great name, Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.